Hello, everyone. Welcome to this masterclass webinar in SolidCam Simultaneous Five Access Milling Part One. Uh, we will wait for another two minutes for uh, the session to start. We'll start exactly at 5.32 p.m. India time. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the uh, Masterclass webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining. A uh, quick introduction. My name is Amod Onkar. I'm the uh, country manager for SolidCam in India and also the product manager for SolidCam uh, in the three axis and five axis segment. Uh, this is going to be a three part webinar and uh, more than uh, showing you sales related stuff or marketing related stuff on solid cams uh, abilities and simultaneous five axis we are going to uh, dive a bit deeper and look more at it on a technical side so it's almost like a short uh, training although uh, in uh, the uh, the time required for anybody to learn solid cams five axis would be approximately a week's time uh, i'm trying to compress it so you will have to understand my uh, uh, <clears throat> my side so that uh, I'm trying to put everything into these three classes. Of course, uh, these webinars are being recorded. So these classes are being recorded and anybody who wants to watch them can go back to our website, look into the recorded webinars section and you'll find uh, these webinars recorded out there. So you will have uh, uh, you can see it at your own pace. You can stop it, look what I've done, and uh, try and attempt it on the paths on your side. Uh, the agenda for today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, show you what all uh, features are there inside SolidCam 5-axis. And uh, then I wouldn't call this a demo, but it's more of an explanation of what 5-axis offerings are there in SolidCam. And then finally, we'll have a summary and a QA and a if possible, if the time allows. The time today is set for 90 minutes, so please be patient. Uh, SolidCam's five access offerings are approximately about eight of them, when I broadly put it in, um, in this presentation. First, we start off with the generic four and five access milling. And then we have multi-access machining, which includes multi-axis roughing and multi-axis uh, wall and floor finishing. We have multi-blade machining for machining impellers and blisks only. We have port machining, which is a module which is specifically developed for machining engine ports uh, or tube-shaped components. Uh, then we have a very powerful uh, module called as rotary machining, which is uh, uh, which which helps basically in machining any part that rotates in for in for axis 
around an axis. It could rotate around X axis or around Y axis. Typical applications for rotary are basically extruder screws, regular screws, or anything that is round shaped or even uh, may not be a cylindrical shape, but has to rotate around a particular axis. So it's basically a four axis strategy. Then in 2021, we introduced two new uh, functions in uh, solid cam five axis. One is edge breaking, and that is for removing the bar that comes up when you machine the entire part. And uh, this particular function eliminates totally the manual work that happens after a part has been uh, uh, made in, <clears throat> in on the CNC machine. And then we have uh, edge trimming which is uh, basically to trim off the edges or make the part to the final shape. Typical applications are in aerospace where you have got composite material parts that need to be trimmed and uh, uh, cut and made to shape, or it could be in automotive where you have got vacuum formed parts and you would like to cut those vacuum formed parts to their final shape. Finally, in 2021, we also introduced Auto 3 Plus to roughing. So today, our goal is to look into generic four and five axis machining and also auto three plus two. So these are the two areas that we are going to explore. Now within uh, the generic four and five axis, we have got several functions, okay? But we are going to restrict ourselves only to, to the first two functions uh, that you see over here, the sin five axis milling and the auto three plus two roughing. We are not gonna touch this. This we are going to do in our part two, where I'll tell you when we are going to do that. So the generic four and five axis solution inside solid cam allows the user to machine any part, any way he or she likes, okay? There is absolutely no limitation on the kind of parts that can be done or the way it can be done, absolutely no limitation. The user's imagination is the only limitation and also, the physical limits of the machine. Those are the only two limitations that can come in. Otherwise, any part, any shape, any way you want can be done inside generic four and five axis machining. The user gets a complete control over the tool axis. There is a very powerful collision control system in built inside uh, the generic five axis solution. We're going to explore that. Nice lead in and lead out mechanisms are provided. The user can choose the way he wants and they can tweak, they can add their own stuff. A lot of things can be done into the leading, lead in and lead out area. And most important in SolidCam's generic five axis is that we support all standard tools, including the, the new generation circle and mills, the barrel tools watch, which are getting pop more and more popular. And the best part is that SolidCam's generic four and five axis machining directly works on the NURBS surfaces. We do not create any intermediate mesh in between. So it's directly machining the surface. So the quality of the surface, if you have got an exceptional quality surface, let's say a class A surface, you can actually reproduce the same inside the five axis uh, system in SolidCam because we are working directly on the NURBS based system. Right. Uh, we we'll go ahead with the uh, the workflow. Uh, this is what I generally uh, suggest. We start with the strategies definition. The user defines or uh, picks the strategy that he would like to machine a particular surface or a particular area with. That defines the tool axis control, gouge control or collision control, and then applies the links. In fact, what I tell to my uh, trainees is that uh, the collision controls should be applied as much minimum as possible in a five axis tool path. The more amount of collisions you'll apply, the more amount of control you'll apply, you will see that the tool path starts losing its sheen because it starts getting a lot of limitations. So the tool axis control here becomes very critical. In fact, a best tool path is the one that actually doesn't have any collision controls applied to it and can be taken care of by just by controlling the tool axis. But in real world, generally this doesn't happen, although in few instances it can be done, but in general world, you cannot do away the collision control, you will have to. 
but try to be as frugal as possible when you're applying the collision control. And then finally, the links. On the strategies front, we have got uh, almost every way of machining or every kind of strategy that one can think of, whether it is parallel cuts, with parallel to X, parallel to Y, constant Z angle at angle to the XY plane, angle in the ZX plane or angle in the YZ plane. You can choose uh, that strategy. You can go parallel to curve, perpendicular to curve, morph between two curves, morph between two surfaces, and then use the projection method to, let's say you would like to do engraving on of a particular shape on, on, a, on a surface in five axis, you can use the projection method. Projection also allows you to do a regular five axis uh, by projecting the tool, uh, the tool path or projecting the curve on a group of surfaces. Once your strategies are picked up, you can then move into the tool axis control. Now this is a bit, uh, I would not say a complex area, but it's a vast area, okay? And uh, you will see that here, the uh, difference starts coming up between a regular three axis machining and a five axis machining. Because in tool axis control, a lot goes, a lot of things happen in your, in your visualization. You must visualize. So there are many ways in which tool axis control can be applied to the uh, tool path. You could say, I, I'm, I would like it to be absolutely normal to the surface every time. The tool must be normal to the surface. Or you can say, the tool is having an angle relative to the cutting direction, or it could be uh, tilted to the surface normal by a particular fixed angle, or it could be rotated around an axis. So there are empty number of options, and then you have got the sub options in which you can just say, I have picked up tilted related to the cutting direction, and then I say, apply the side tilt uh, strategy, and once side tilt strategy is applied, you can then define where your contact point is going to be, whether your contact point or the, or the angle is being controlled by the user by simply putting in the uh, lead, lead and lag angle or side tilt angle, or in the new uh, versions of solid cam, we have got uh, a way of defining the tilt angle, and that is by defining the contact point on the tool which point on the tool is going to be always in contact with the uh, with the surface that determines the tilt angle this particular area was specially developed for handling barrel tools okay so we are going to see even this uh, this region on uh, on some of our parts today once you have the uh, tool axis applied comes the collision control and solid cam is perhaps one of those rare softwares where collision control is really uh, defined very clearly. We have got four groups. You can define four different collision reactions even to the same surface. One reaction could be it should pull away from the surface. Other reaction could be it, should be, it could tilt from the surface. Other reaction could be just trim off those colliding paths, or you could have few more reactions like just stop the tool path calculation or just report if the tool path has collisions, because in some cases, like I said before, we do not apply collision controls, but you could tell to solid cam to uh, give a report back to the user if it found any collisions in the tool path during the calculation. So there are many methods in which uh, collision controls can be applied in solid cam. Collision control can also be used for machining very bad surfaces, okay? In our part two of our webinar, we are going to take, that's, that'll happen next week, we're going to take a really bad surface, and I'm going to show you how collision control allows you to machine such bad surface effortlessly. You don't need, you don't need any special uh, function for that, but you'll just purely use collision controls to get flawless tool paths on those bad surfaces. After you have performed your collision control, you can move into the links and you can see that there are several different methods in which links can be applied on, uh, on your tool path, whether it's the first entry or exit or the first ex last exit, or it could be within the tool path when you have got number of uh, uh, tool path passes, how are you going to link between them? Should they go to the retract plane? Should you blend a spline between them? Should you directly connect those two passes? 
everything here is controlled by the user right so the links are also very powerful uh, we have got a tangential arc reverse tangential arc vertical tangential arc an orthogonal line tangential line and then of course what we call as the automatic arc wherein the software itself will determine whether it has to use a combination of a single arc or a combination of a horizontal and a vertical arc depending on the situation in which it is currently generating the toolpath. So all these are available to the user at a click of a button. After links, we have got an option called roughing and more, which basically allows you or the user to create multiple passes from a single pass. You have generated one slice and now you could offset that slice taking into account the geometry on the side. For example, let's say you have an impeller and you want to machine or rough out the impeller. All you have to do is to generate the floor finishing program and just keep offsetting it, taking into account the blade surfaces. This can be done effortlessly inside the roughing and more. We are going to see the option uh, today. Uh, we also have within the roughing and more the option to mirror the toolpath or to define a stock so that you don't end up cutting air. So you can define stock and make sure that the toolpaths are trimmed off. Uh, those toolpaths which are going out of the stock, stock area are automatically trimmed out. And you could generate a plunging program from a simple uh, uh, five axis program. You could generate plunging passes. You could morph a pocket or you could even do an area roughing. We are going to see some options today from this roughing and more. And then we go into a very complex area called as pole handling. Uh, pole handling, what, what is basically a pole? A pole is, that, is, is a situation in which your spindle and your tool axis are parallel to each other. So let's say you're machining a spear and the first point on the spear is exactly in the center. So the tool will be straight following the Z axis. So that particular position is called a pole. And when a pole comes or when, when, a, when a situation comes where uh, you are, we, we call it a pole situation or a singularity, we, call it, we also call it a singularity. When you are in a singularity situation or a pole situation, there are a lot of things that the machine can do, okay? Or the software can do. Because in a, in a pole position, it could simply lock the fourth and fifth axis and do just do the three axis machining. It's still possible, okay? because there is no tilt, or it could just rotate the part, keeping the tool stationary. There are several things that can be done when the tool hits the singularity of the pole position. So this area in, in SolidCAM controls the pole handling of, uh, of uh, in, in five axis rather. So there are different methods. Again, this area, the pole handling is a short, very short area, but we are going to see it either in the second part or on the third part. Finally, the kind of tools that are supported inside SolidCAM, we support almost every possible tool that are there, the standard ones, basically, whether it's an end mill, bull nose, ball nose, face and mill, dovetail mill, taper mill, taper ball nose, slot mill, lollipop cutter, barrel shape tool, oval form tool, lens form tool, or barrel taper. So you name the tool and these tools are all supported inside SolidCAM. It's a generic, basically. I'm, when I see right now solid cam, I'm talking about the generic four and five axis. Now we are actually going to be uh, focusing ourselves when I talk about the tools. Okay, when I talk about the tools, I'm going to be focusing uh, uh, my next slide on this area, which is the barrel tools or circle end mills. These are something that are being uh, talked about today in the market, because wherever I go, the first thing they ask is, do you support circle end mills? Do you support this tool? Do you support an oval form tool? So that's something that people ask me. So let's let's look a, delve a bit deeper into the circle end mills or the circle end mill support inside SolidCAM. So uh, SolidCAM supports four types of barrel tools or circle end mills. One is the barrel shape itself. We have oval form paper form and a lens shape. So all these four uh, yeah, four type of tools are supported inside 
solid cam. More and more tool manufacturers today are introducing this. Earlier it was just one and two, and now almost everybody has come up with a line of tools for circle end mills. They are promising. Uh, to some extent, it is true that you could reduce your machining time by almost 90% when using with circle end mills. There is a theory or uh, there is a scientific evidence for it uh, why the time comes down. We introduced a support to solid cam in our 2019 version way back in about 2018 when we released 2019 version. Solid cam had support for these circle end mills. And like I said, it supports four uh, different shapes. I told you that we have a, there is a scientific evidence on why uh, the machining time comes down. The evidence is right straight in front of you. Assume that we have to cut a straight surface here and uh, we have got a combination or we have got an option of using a ball nose or a oval form tool. Let's assume I'm using a 16 diameter ball nose and the cusp that I get is about one micron or 1.2 micron. If I take a step down of about uh, 0 0.5 millimeter, I get, a, I get that particular cusp. But when I use an oval form tool, an oval form tool has got a very large radius on the flank. So let's say I'm using a 12 diameter uh, oval form tool. So a 12 diameter generally will have anywhere between 75 to 80 radius. So it's like using a diameter seven, <clears throat> sorry, a diameter 150 or diameter 160 millimeter tool so the amount of step down that it can take will be thrice or four times and still will give you a much smaller scallop. Okay, that is the evidence. So instead of going at 0.5, I would perhaps go at 1.5 millimeter step down. So straight away, my machining time will come down without compromising on the scallop uh, height. My scallop height, in fact, is much lower than the, uh, than the, uh, uh, scallop that I would uh, attain with a ball nose tool. So this helps in reducing the machining time considerably. It's, it's, it's a proven fact. Why use circle end mills? So there are several theories of why circle end mills are needed. First of all, when you're using the flank of a tool, let's say an end mill or a bull nose tool, there are inaccuracies and tool deflections, and these generally create marks on the so on straight or concave uh, walls. And on the other hand, the tools with barrel section are pretty robust and because of the large radius, even if there is a, uh, even if there is a tool deflection, it will still be on the ball, on the side radius. So the scallop is not affected. So the accuracy also is not affected. So they are pretty accurate when it comes to machining without the problems of inaccuracies or Tool, definite, uh, tool deflections. The benefits of circle end mills are low cusp height with a very a high step over. It can balance machine inaccuracies because of the radius on the sides, smooth transitions uh, between the cuts, and it has got lower dynamic disturbance due to short tools. Because you're using the uh, barrel tools, I'll show you in the example, you can tilt the tool and actually go very deep into the into the uh, area by using short tools. So when it's 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 a no-brainer that when you have a short tool, your uh, dynamic difference uh, disturbances are very low. The moment you increase your tool length, it starts deflecting. That's the principle uh, that that we all know. So most of the barrel tools are not long; they are pretty short because they use the advantage of the large radius and thereby tilt and go deep into the uh, area where they are machining. Uh, you can use uh, the barrel tools by tilting them and to reach the most difficult to reach areas. Uh, let's assume that you have got a, just a straight wall and the length of the wall or the height of the wall is approximately about 100 and 120. Now, most of the end mills will stop at about 80 or 90. You cannot go below that. After that, the only way is to tilt the tool and use a ball nose and go with a very small depth of cut. Here, you could change over to a barrel tool and you could tilt and go with a much higher step down, yet generate a much lower scallop. Some tools in barrel uh, uh, or circle end mills, like the oval form tool, also have got an additional small radius at the tip. And these can be used, or this particular radius of the tip can be used 
into the areas which are very difficult to otherwise reach with a regular uh, side milling. So let's say you've got two walls and then there's a fillet in between. You can actually machine the fillet with the same barrel tool, but using the tip of the tool and not the flank. But barrel tools are not a panacea for everything. Okay, it's not that barrel tools or circle end mills can machine everything that are thrown up. They thrown at or at them. They definitely have their limitations, and we have to understand that they cannot do everything. So, what are the challenges or what are the limitations? First of all, if you're having a convex shape, if the profile is having a convex shape, it doesn't make any sense to use a barrel tool because the kind of uh, the kind of uh, scallop that it will generate will be similar to the kind of scallop a flattened mill would generate, okay? So uh, use a flattened mill with a flank, the step over is anyway limited when, when you go with a, uh, a convex shape tool. And user need not worry about the uh, inaccuracies of the mark because they can still use either a flattened mill bull nose or a ball nose. If you have areas where you have a concave radius that is smaller than the barrel radius, again, here, barrel tool cannot be used, okay? For example, the examples that you see here, the figures that you see here, you can, you can be rest assured that you cannot use barrel tools here because the radius, the concave radius is much smaller than the radius of the uh, barrel tool itself. In such cases, it makes sense to use a smaller ball nose end, ball nose cutter and machine it. Also, barrel tools or circle end mills cannot be used in three axis machining. Just doesn't make sense. Because if you, use, if you do that, only the front tip will be in contact. That's the principle of three axis. So it doesn't make any sense. It's better to use a ball nose because in ball nose, you can go with smaller radiuses and yet generate a similar scallop. Whereas with uh, barrel end mills, since the tip is always a very small and generally it is R2 or R3. It's like using a four diameter or six diameter cutter. So it just doesn't make sense. So it cannot be used where tilting is not possible. For example, a three axis machine. Another uh, challenge that we get with barrel tools is that barrel tools are good enough when the surface curvature or the shape of the surface is consistent. But if you have got a, a situation like this, where you have got one, uh, one area with this particular curvature and on a, another small area in between with a different curvature, the scallop that you would try to generate on a larger area doesn't, is not applicable onto the smaller area, which means that you'll have to split, you have to machine that separately. So this is a challenge. I mean, this is a process challenge itself, okay? so. Uh, it's difficult to machine with a barrel or circle end mills when you have got uh, uh, surfaces with different curvatures, okay? You cannot get the scallop that you need. Generally, scallops are calculated based on the surface curvature itself. Another challenge in barrel tools is that you will see that most of the barrel tools are good only for finishing. You'll, you'll never see the uh, tool uh, uh, tool manufacturer recommend uh, the tool for roughing or any other thing. It's only for finishing. And that too, if you go with typical uh, tool manufacturers, they'll tell you it can remove not more than 0.3 to 0.4. So when such, uh, such a thing is there for the tools, it becomes much more uh, critical to uh, rearrange your process in such a way that when it is machining, for example, in this case, when it is machining uh, the surface, you actually finish or remove the material at the bottom first up to the fillet and then allow it to machine from top to bottom. Because if it goes from top to bottom, a point will come where the small radius will start getting heavy material because this area starts getting in contact with the material. And when this happens, there are chances that it could chip off or wear very quickly. So it, the fillets and the bottom must be finished first before you can attempt to machine the flanks using these kind of tools. In solid cam, we have got, like I said, we have got special uh, tool access controls for barrel tools. And when you define a barrel tool, these options open up. OK, 
okay we are going to uh, see that so what we have in solid cam is what we call as a, a static mode and a dynamic mode in a static mode we can say that my tool contact point is somewhere here and we could we can say it's at 40 percent of the uh, barrel shape and it will always maintain the contact point at that point and it perhaps the contact point will come here and the tool path will stop here because beyond that that contact point will violate whatever you have set the other way is dynamic we can say that you can start at 40 40 percent but you can end at two percent so it will do all the machining more than what it could have done with a static mode all the way up to here of course again it cannot finish we have to use some other method to finish that so we have got uh, two methods in which uh, uh, we can handle the uh, circle end mills the tool axis basically automatic tilting is something that we introduced way back in 2019 and this was introduced with a special function for barrel tools uh, that does the smoothing smoothing of the uh, entire contour when it's doing tilting. Uh, that's because tilting on a ball nose tool and tilting on a uh, on a barrel tool are two different things. In a ball nose tool, when you tilt, the center point remains the same. It doesn't change. But when you tilt on the barrel tool, because the barrel tool has got a center that is completely outside the tool, tilting is almost like moving the tool away. It's not just like tilting the uh, spindle or tilting the table it's almost like pushing the tool away and that the fact is because the uh, barrel profile center is always off axis it's never on the axis of the barrel tool okay with this as our uh, starting point let's slowly go into the product and i say slowly it, i really don't make uh, mean very slowly i'm going to go into the product so the first thing that we are going to look at in solid cam is basically the strategies. They are simple. So I'm going to start with the first one and that's the perpendicular to the curve, uh, parallel to the curve. So if I look at which curve, I can see that that's my curve and my cuts will all be parallel to this when machining this. We are not worried about the tool axis. The tool axis will come a bit later. We are only worried about what we are going to see as a pattern okay so this is a pattern and these are the faces that we are going to machine and the resultant tool path looks like that okay so it started 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 and it as it goes inside it starts going parallel to the outer curve so this is one of the pattern the second pattern is perpendicular to the curve so let's create that perpendicular to curve my geometry is still the same and the lead curve i'm going to define new one i will pick this particular curve here okay this one and all my cuts are going to be perpendicular to this curve they're going to follow the perpendicularity of the curve so let's calculate this tool path done you can see that the cuts that it generated we are all perpendicular. So if I project this tool path onto the surface, wherever it meets the surface and wherever the cuts are, if I measure the angle, it's always going to be 90 degrees to the curve, okay? So I could have any kind of curve. For example, I can change the curve. Okay, let's look at some other curve that we have, uh, not that one. Yeah, that curve. So I want the cuts to be uh, perpendicular to that curve. You can see that it used the length of this curve and it's only giving you the tool path within that because beyond that, there is no curve and there is no way it can generate anything perpendicular to something that doesn't exist. So it's also maintaining the width of the curve when it is generating the tool path. Right, so that was about perpendicular to curve. And then we have, uh, morph between two curves so i have got uh, let's say this curve and then i have got the bottom curve and then these are my faces to machine and my tool path looks like that it's actually going to follow the top curve on the first pass and the bottom curve on the last pass and everything in between them will be morphed okay 
Uh, and then we have a parallel to curve. So I have got uh, this curve here. If I look at the curve, the bottom curve, and this is the faces that I'm going to machine, and the resultant toolpath is that. So if you uh, if I go into the simulation and go into the first pass, okay, and if I go into the front view, you can see that the tool is slightly tilted. Assume this was not tilted, okay? This was straight. That position is what we call as a pole position or a singularity. You can have, for example, the tool is machining from this point to this point. So let's say uh, the tool uh, is machining from this point to this point. So there will be a point on the tool path where the tool is actually going to be straight, parallel to the Z axis. When that happens, it's called as singularity. And when that happens, many things can happen on the machine, okay? Your part can rotate or you could, your tool could be straight and it could just continue doing the tilting, okay? So a lot of things can happen when you're doing uh, machining using singularity. So that's what exactly is singularity about. And then, uh, of course, here, parallel to curve. So there are many uh, examples. So this is the curve. This is the face that we want to machine. And this is the resultant tool path. You can see that it's going parallel to this curve as much as possible. And finally, you just get one small area. Okay, it just keeps offsetting the curve on the surface. And that's how the pattern is generated. And then, of course, we have uh, a projection. Okay, so you can project the tool path. It's like engraving. It's going to follow this curve because it's taken this curve and projected it onto that surface. And I can, I can push the tool inside so that it creates a impression on the part. So this is basically projection. So all you need is a 2D curve and just project it. Or you could simply take a font and write anything on the surface by putting the font on the plane and then projecting that font using the toolpath projection method. So this was basically the, I would say the main strategies that we are going to use, okay? Now let's go and uh, increase our, uh, what we can say, the knowledge a bit more. I use this example quite a lot because it gives us, it gives the uh, people who are looking at the product more insight into what I mean when I say tool access control. Let's forget the pink colored object for a moment. We assume that it is not there. So we have this simple dovetail kind of a surface and I would like to machine this surface. So there are many ways in which I can machine the surface. For example, I'll add the same five axis milling. So I uh, in my presentation, I said, first we de determine the strategies. So I'm going to use parallel cuts. <clears throat> we are going to see a few of them here. The geometry I would like to machine, I can al always pick it from an existing geometry that was done for an operation. If I don't know what it was, I can just scroll in my geometry uh, page here. So I know that this is the geometry that I would like to machine, so I accept it. You don't need to reselect every time. Once you define a geometry, it's stored into the part, okay? So you can always call the same geometry in any of your tool parts. Uh, I'm gonna go to the tool. I will select the tool. In this case, uh, let me reduce that. Uh, I'm going to use a ball nose mill, okay? For some reason, I'll use a ball nose. Uh, levels nothing just the tool path parameter i'm going to use a step down of one millimeter and we go to the tool axis control the most important one so uh, i've got the tool axis control so let's look at some important things here what what do i mean again like i said forget the pink one we have the regular blue one so i have this uh sorry where am I? Okay. So 
there are two ways in which we can machine the uh, surface. One is that your tool is normal to the surface. Okay, this is how the tool stands. This is how your tool will be. The other one, and this is when your tilt angle is zero. The other one is this one. The tool can be like this. You could be using the flank of the tool. Okay, so this angle here is 90. So there are two main possibilities. Either the tool could be at zero degrees or it could be at 90 degrees. Anything in between that is going to be an interpolation of the angle, tilt angle. So when the tool tilts across the tool path, it's, a it's the tilt angle. When it tilts along the cutting direction or the tool, tool path direction, we call it either a lead angle or a lag angle, okay? The lead lag angle cannot be seen in this view. The lead lag angle can be seen in uh, this view. So when you're going from uh, this position to this position here, sorry. When you're going or when the tool is traveling in this way, the tool can either be this way or the tool can be in this way. Okay, so depending on which side the angle is, you could call this as a lead or a lag angle, okay? It's like drag. So what we're going to do here is we will apply the first one, zero. Let's look at how the result comes when the zero is applied. So just hit the calculate button and we have the tool path. So if I now simulate this tool path, you can see that the tool is absolutely normal to the surface. So this angle, okay, this angle here, this one is 90, but we call it the zero position, okay? So this is when it's at zero. Let's change. Instead of going at zero, I'll make this 90. And let's see what happens, okay? And now if I run the simulation, okay? you can see that the tool is absolutely parallel following the surface. So this angle here is 90 because it's 90 to the normal, normal of the surface. The normal of the surface is pointing in this direction. So you have got, like I said, two possibilities. Uh, the first one was zero, the other one was 90. So let's move slightly ahead. We have a problem here. The tool is dipping into the surface. So we have to stop, otherwise this, part will be rejected. So to stop it, we have got an option to apply a collision control. So we have got collision controls and I'm going to use the first collision control wherein I will switch off because SolidCam is asking me against which surface do you would like to check for collisions? So I'm switching off my drive surface. I don't want to check the drive surface, which is the surface that I want, I'm machining. I would like to check it with a check surface with tool shaft and tool chip, tool tip. These are the two elements of the tool that I would like to check for in collision. What is the strategy? First of all, let's pick the surface that I would like to check for collision. So this is the surface I would like to check for collision. And now SolidCam is asking me, what would you like to do when I find collisions? So the first thing, very obvious thing is to retract the tool off. Okay, so I'm going to pull the tool up. The tool can be retracted in several ways. Let's forget about all those. Let's assume there is only one way and that is to retract the tool along the axis of the tool itself, okay? Let's hit the save and calculate button and look at how the tool path comes. Okay, you can see that now it's disappeared. There are no more, there are no more passes below this. The tool path was pulled up and no more collisions. I can also provide a stock option that means i can ask solid cam to stop one millimeter above the check surface so if i calculate this you'll see that the tool stopped exactly one millimeter above the surface it, it didn't go below that so you can also apply the collision what else can be seen in this you can apply what we call as the links so let's look at the links we have got the first link and the last exit. That's, that is the first entry and the last exit. So we can go into the link. In link, SolidCam has got two areas. 
the first and last ent the first entry and last exit is one area where you can apply the links and then you have got links within the toolpath okay so let's look at the first one i'll say when it's coming from the clearance plane down it should use a lead in and i'm going to define what kind of a lead in it must use so i'm not going to use a default you can set by the way the default i'm going to use a tangential arc and the arc diameter is 200% of the tool uh, rate diameter and it should sweep 90 degrees okay and the same thing i'm going to apply when it leaves the job so i'm going to apply another tangential arc 200 say okay let's hit the calculate button so what we have here we have got a nice arc in the start coming from outside entering the path and then machining it and then it goes here and then it dips down because the arc is following the tool now the surface normal okay the arc is following the surface normal this could potentially have implications it could collide against the surface which you can later see in the uh, simulation but how to avoid this you can simply go here and instead of saying go exactly or follow exactly the surface normal i will say lift up by 10 millimeters okay and i'll calculate this you can see that the arc lifted itself up 10 millimeters this point was down 10 millimeters up and there it's gone or instead of using all that uh, tangential arc i will just use a tangential line and say just pull out 10 millimeters on the same height and show me how the toolpath looks like so you can see it finished the cutting pulled out 10 millimeters and then it's going to retract okay so you can apply different uh different uh methods of link into this you can even play some games with the laden for example my user says no i don't like tangential arc i would like it to do a helical ramping kind of a uh, approach but we don't have any helical ramping here okay but you can trick or you can use the tricks inside solid cam i can say okay well not 90 i would like to have 720 degrees of rotation 200 but a height of five when i do that i simply will get a very nice and a beautiful looking sorry what was that tangential arc yes okay let's say 360 100 two millimeters okay Up. we have a problem here yeah so what we basically do here is uh something that's crazy it should not have happened okay well what i should it should have done here is it should have ideally created a helical ramp here okay but we'll come to that a bit later now that we have generated a very nice looking toolpath i would like to replicate the same on this pink colored area okay on the pink pink colored surface however we have got a, a small trick in here or we have got a small issue and that small issue out here is this fillet okay because now we are going to come into the real world examples okay you will not find any part with a sharp corner that's going to be very rare that you're going to find a part with a sharp corner. Most of the times it's going to have a fillet. So I have created the same example, but with a fillet. So I'm going to copy this operation, paste it, and I'll edit this toolpath. And all I'm going to do now is to change the drive surface. Instead of this, now I'll say I have this surface and I also have a fillet. Okay, two surfaces. Nothing else, I'll just give the calculate button. Once it reaches on the fillet, you can see it goes all crazy. Okay, although the toolpath looks very nice, it's going crazy. Let's look what is happening here. So let's start. Okay. Sorry, again, let's do this. 
and as it goes on to the uh, uh, on the uh, fillet, you can see what is happening. It starts tilting outwards. Okay, but if you ask me, is it doing something wrong? No, it's not. It's doing exactly what you want. Okay, because if I mark now, if I take this area and if I ask what is happening here, the surface normal is in this way. Okay, this is the surface normal at that point, and this is the tool axis. What is the angle? The angle is 90 degree. You ask 90 degrees, and it is giving you 90 degrees. Okay, so it's not doing anything wrong. It's doing theoretically exactly right what you have asked it to do. Okay, so you can imagine what is going to happen at the end. It's going to be completely horizontal. Okay, and that's not what we want. Okay, here is where I call the kindergarten classes end, and we start with real world examples of tool axis control. So it's very clear that this particular tool axis is not going to work here. We need a different kind of a tool axis. What is that? Now, there are many other methods in which you could control the tool. One of the method is to use tilted through curve, something that as a user, you're going to use quite a lot. I would say 90% of the times you're going to use tilted through curve. You're going to provide a curve and the tool will always follow that curve. And you can take any example today and almost every example uses this method of tilted through curve. So I will pick this curve. I've created a simple line here, up here. So I'll pick this, accept it, say okay, and I'll say follow the closest point. That means the toolpath, if, ha if it has 10 points on the toolpath on that one particular toolpath, those 10 points will be mapped onto this curve and each of the power point on the toolpath will be connected to the point on the curve. And that's how the tool axis will be derived. Okay, that's it, that's, that's it. I don't need anything else. I'll just hit the calculate button. You can see it's much better except for the fact that the tool is retracting somewhere here in between. Now this retract happens because of my link. We, we saw the first lead in and the last lead out, but there are also lead in and lead out happening in between the tool path. For example, this is one slice and this is the second slice. So the tool is connecting or using the links here. It's following the links between the slices. So there is a value called 110% of the step over. That means if I'm using one millimeter step over, if any gap between the two strands of the tool path is more than 1.1, it will retract to the clearance plane. If it is less than 1.1, it will just connect it directly like it has connected it directly. Now we can do two things. I can push this to make it direct here. Very bad idea. I'll still keep it to the clearance plane or I will increase this value from 110 to 300% step over. So up to three millimeters, just join it directly. Now if I calculate, you will see that that retract has disappeared, okay? Of course, you can do a lot of other things with the links. Instead of joining them straight, you can say blend a spline. And if I run the calculation, you can see that it made it smooth. You can also do this method. But now you can see the simulation. Now you no longer have that. The tool axis is always passing through the center line or the line that you have, we just picked, the curve. It's always passing through that. It will always do that. Sorry, I'm going to go to the front view. And you can see that as it starts going down, the tool will start tilting more and more.
You can see always it passes through the curve, but observe what else happened some here. The holder was colliding against the geometry. So we have a collision. We now need to fix also the collision because this is going to happen in your real world examples also. It's pretty simple inside solid cam. So we're going to the collision check. First, I'm going to retract against the <clears throat> against the surface so that it doesn't collide here. But I also want to give another collision check with this surface here so that we don't get collisions with the holder. So I apply the second collision check. I enable it. And in the collision check, I don't want it to check the tooltip and tool shaft, but I want to check with the holder and the arbor. And here I'm going to use tilt tool. You can see I can apply different reactions. And the area to be checked is this. Okay. Say done and calculate. Okay. Let's run the simulation. Again, let's go to the front view. And let's look what happens now. <clears throat> You can see it tilted automatically. The moment it came within the range defined as the clearance value inside solid cam, it starts tilting. Now this clearance value can be controlled by the user. He can go pretty close or he can keep it slightly more also. So as it comes close to the uh, uh, area, which has been defined, this value here, when it comes close to it, You can see that it started tilting because beyond that it would have it would have had collisions with the geometry. And it keeps that clearance continuously when it's doing the machining. Where do we find this clearance? Very simple. This clearance can be found straight over here. If I go into my clearance data, I can specify what should be the clearance between the surface and the holder, the minimum clearance, okay? Maximum can be anything. So we can define these clearance values and these values will be maintained when it's doing the collision check. Good. Now that we have seen some examples of how we apply the strategy, how we apply the link, how we apply collision check and how we apply the tool access control. Let's look and take this knowledge into our real world examples, okay? This was a pretty simple one just to show you how the strategies, tool access, gout check, et cetera, they work. So let's look at the first example. I'm going to open one file. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a nice uh, turbine blade, a gas turbine blade. And we are going to see several things that are applied in, uh, in this area. The first one, when we do the finishing of the aerofoil. When we do the aerofoil finishing, I can do it in several ways. First of all, I can use a <clears throat> morph between two surfaces, so I have got these surfaces as my area or the part surface to be cut. And then I can ask solid cam to go from this surface to this surface. So make a morph or make the pattern between these two surfaces. And if I calculate this tool path, <clears throat> okay, so you can see that the tool path is done, and this is how it's actually going to uh, machine. Simple, the tool is always normal to the surface, and it just winds like a spiral around the surface. This, although might look very uh, nice and might look visually very appealing, this actually is never used in machining. The reason being, when you when I stop the tool, let's go ahead slightly.
the tool contact is exactly on the tip. And this is the point where the tool actually has zero RPM. So it's actually never recommended that the tool um, work this way. So either I will have tilt the tool on this side, or I will have to use the lag angle on the other side to make sure that the side of the tool is always cutting. How do we do that? Simple. I go to the next tool path that's here. And instead of using straight or zero degrees always, I'm going to use 45 degrees. So I've tilted the tool by 45 degrees. Let's calculate this. <clears throat> now, if I run the simulation, you can see what is happening. We are using not the tip of the tool, but here I'm using the uh, side of the tool always. So if you can see the contact, the contact is never the tip. The contact is always the side of the tool where it has a pretty good RPM. So this results in much better cutting. Uh, it's the same principle also for bullnose, okay? When you, you're using a bullnose tool and then you want to machine uh, this kind of a profile with the bullnose, and if you're given it zero, you are actually going to have the tip of the bullnose always uh, cutting, the center of the bullnose always cutting the, uh, the uh, surface, which is never recommended, okay? You can, you can uh, rest be assured that you'll never, first of all, get a good finish, and the cutting will also be not nice. Here also, you can see the tool is uh, cutting from the center. The, the center portion of the tool is in contact with the aerofoil. Not a good uh, way of uh, doing it. So what we can do also with the bull nose is we can apply several things. For example, I can apply a tilt. And let's calculate this tilt of 45 degrees. So I have this, and now if I run the simulation here, you can see that we are using the side of the tool. Yeah, so if I do a machine simulation of this, you will see that it's much more efficient when you use the side of the tool for cutting. cutting. Okay, let's switch off the uh, machine housing. And let's start the so you're using the side of the tool to cut. Now, what you can also see here is that if I show you the axis movements, my B axis and C axis are continuously moving. Okay. Some users don't like it. They say no, I just should have my C axis rotating and my B axis should be fixed. It should not tilt. At one point, it should you lock the axis and you machine it. That's pretty simple in SolidCam. I simply go to that same tool path again. And here, instead of five axis, I'll say four axis. And my rotary is Z, and I will lock my fifth axis at 45 degrees. This is real-time calculation, nothing, uh, no uh, playing of movies, etc. So now if I uh, go into the simulation, machine simulation, of course, uh, it's you, you, you cannot see these effects in the regular host simulation inside the software. It's only uh, possible in the machine simulation. You can see the B-axis out here on the right-hand side, it's locked at 45, okay? So only the C-axis will rotate now. The B axis is now locked at 45 degrees. It doesn't change. So you have locked one axis and you're just moving the fourth of uh, uh, the other four axes, the X, Y, uh, Z, and C axis. So it's almost like four plus one. So it's pretty simple to make this inside solid cam. Right. Uh, the most important aspect in, in machining uh, or turbine blade is uh, the root fillet. Okay. That can be done pretty easily. We, we can use what we call as uh, uh, morph between two curves. 
So you have the drive surfaces, which are the fillet, and then you have got one curve and another curve here. So there are two curves that I've selected, and the tool axis here, exactly like what I did earlier with the aerofoil, I'm using a fourth axis, and I've locked the fifth axis at 45 degrees. And let's calculate this tool path. And the tool, of course, here I'm using is a taper ball nose. So I'm going to calculate that. Done. So this is how my tool path looks like. If I run the simulation of this in the machine, again, you will see my fifth axis locked at 45, only the X, Y, Z, and C axis rotating thereby finishing the fillet, fillets at the bottom. You can see B axis locked again at 45 degrees. And now it's doing the only the fillets. You can also overlap into the airfoil area. That also can be done because it's pretty simple. It doesn't uh, take much time. Right. Another very important aspect here is our uh, floor, that floor that needs to be finished. Now the floor can be done in two ways, okay? One, you could just do a swarfing, but generally not recommended in this kind of machines, because if you look at this taper here, this, this is tapering down. So there is every chance that the head might touch the uh, one of the elements and it does actually in this part. So we can't use swarf here. The other method is to use a, a regular morph between two curves. So what I have here is uh, uh, in the geometry, I've got these faces and then I've got two curves, one and the second one, which is this one. And what I've done here is uh, let's switch off this and calculate this tool path. So I have some tool path like this. If I run the simulation, you will see that you perhaps may not like how it looks like, but that's what I want so that we can correct it. Okay, so this is my tool path and let's reduce the speed. So this is how it's going to run. You'll see that the C axis is rotating, B axis is rotating, X, Y, and Z. So it's a true five axis happening. But if you look at the geometry, do you really need this? It's, it's not necessary that you need to do all five axis. You can just simply do a simple three plus two machining and finish the uh, machining of, that, of, of, the, of the floor. But how do we do that? Because it's very difficult to first identify what is going to be my three plus two angle, first of all. We don't know. What is the angle? To overcome that, SolidCam has got a very interesting functionality inside the tool axis control called as maintain common direction. So if I select this option here, SolidCam will find the best three plus two direction, lock the fourth and fifth axis and only do the machining in three axis. So let's calculate by selecting the maintain common tool direction uh, button here. Okay. Now, if I take this into machine simulation, you'll see that it has found the best possible B angle and the best possible C angle to lock it. Okay, you can see the C and B are locked. No more, no more uh, five axis machining. It has simply converted the five axis into a simple three plus two axis machining. So you don't need to do anything. You just need to select the uh, find the best common tool axis, and it will machine the part by finding the best possible tool axis. You can have completely different applications. You can think of now where all you could apply this particular application where you could ask the software to find the best possible three plus two direction. Right, so this was a bit about turbine blades, how we machine them, how we use the tilt, and uh, how we use the common uh, axis direction. Let's go to another part very quickly. I've got few parts today because I would like to show you the generic power in, uh, in full glory. 
the most common one comes up is the impeller. Of course, today the systems are there, including solid cam, that can machine an impeller with bare minimum input and almost in an automated way. What if you had to machine an impeller and you did not have the automatic functionality? If you had to use just the generic and if you had to machine the impeller, how would you do that? <clears throat> So I've got a very simple impeller here. And I would now like, first of all, to rough the blades, the area between the blades. And I would also like to finish the blades and the floor. That's, that's the whole crux of, uh, of an impeller. So let me edit this toolpath. And I'll explain to you what I've done for roughing using generic, OK? Nothing is automatic here. Everything is user defined. Just going to switch off certain things here. Uh, yeah. So what I've done is I've used an option called as parallel to curves. You can also use parallel to surface. You've got this geometry. I select two blades, including their front fillets. And I also select their bottom edge as two drive curves. Right. Once that is done, I generate a single toolpath, a single line toolpath. The goal is to get a very nice single line toolpath, which is actually like as if it's doing swarf. So if I run the simulation, I'm I've generated very simple single line toolpath. On both the flanks. That's all I need. Once this toolpath is established that it is good and collision free, what I will do now is I will use a function inside roughing and more. I told you that there are many functions. One of them is called area roughing. And I'll use the area roughing function and the rotary axis around which this is going to rotate, the fourth axis is around Z. The step over is 1.5, and we, use, we are going to use a zigzag method. So I will just apply this method. And what it will do now is it will generate what we call as the uh, floor finishing kind of a toolpath. It'll look like as if we're doing the floor finishing. So from one pass, I now got a toolpath that's machining the area between these two flanks. Now, all I need to do is to provide the depths. Okay, that's also a very simple affair. I'll edit this toolpath. To provide the depth, instead of going by number of cuts as one, I will say full start and end at exact, or full cuts avoid exact edges and calculate. So now it's going to use the depth of cut, whatever I've given as a depth of cut and generate the depth passes for me. So you'll see that it is going to generate 80 passes for me on this particular impeller. Done. Collating the toolpaths, and we'll get our roughing toolpath. So what I simply did was select the two flanks, generate a single strand toolpath, the, apply the area roughing to generate the uh, the floor kind of a finishing, and then use this toolpath to create an offset on the entire uh, 
area between the two blades and generate the uh, roughing toolpath. Right, so that was using generic, we created roughing. So this is how it's going to look like. You can see there's the first layer, second layer, third layer. So it keeps on going with like that, layer by layer, layer by layer, layer by layer. Right, of course, with SolidCam, you also have the automated option, but that is for the third session. Uh, then we come to the finishing. Again, pretty simple. We use what we call as parallel to curve methodology here. We have the geometry. So I pick the three flanks here, and I will ask the software to generate passes parallel to the curve that I selected, the edge. And how does the uh, tool axis control look? I've given a small tilt of five degrees. So I'm not going exactly with the flank machining, but I'm tilting the tool slightly so that I use the tip or what people call as, call as point milling, okay? So we just tilt the tool slightly more than 90 degrees. So we allow the clearance to be about four or five degrees, and that will be more than enough to generate what we call as a point milling. The depth of cut here is one millimeter. And let's simply calculate this tool path. I've already calculated, but let me calculate it again. That's done. This is how the tool path looks like. You can see that it starts parallel to the bottom curve so that it generates a small cut here. Once that cut is done, it uh, it's created a nice spline between those two passes, applied a nice lead in here and lead out, and it goes to the next slice. So if you look at how this is going to look on the machine, I have a Dusan DVF5000 DVF here. Okay, the machine looks something like this. I'll switch off the uh, outer area and let's run. So that's how it's going to machine the flank. Now, machining this flank was very similar to the first example that we saw in where I created two parts, one blue colored and pink colored. This particular flank did not have any fillets in the bottom and you're not gonna have any impeller today in the world that doesn't have any.
have this ruled surface. I created another ruled surface. How did I do that? Again, going to ruled surface, pick this. Instead of tangent, I'll say go normal. So it goes straight away up. So I can pick these three edges and I can I get a very nice ruled surface. Okay. So what I did was I created another ruled surface here. to drive the tool okay simple so let's switch off the ruled surfaces that we just created if you see the curve that we used show oh this was a line sorry here we did not use the tilt curve but we used tilt lines so what I've, i you can use even tilt curves it doesn't uh, make any uh, difference what I've also done here is I have generated lines, simple sketches, and the tool is actually going to follow these lines and not only machine the flank, but also machine your fillet without, because the access tool access will be controlled by the lines and not by the surface or the angle. Okay, so it's pretty simple, just a few lines. So let's look at how the simulation looks like. Again, it's following the same method here. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it completely machines this entire thing, including the fillet. So you can use different methods here. The last one in this part is floor. The floor is simply the copy of the first operation. Uh, somebody just wrote to me in the message saying that my screen is frozen. Is it frozen now? Because I, I see uh, the uh, uh, graphics being updated, so I believe it's it's okay. Great. Okay, maybe my internet froze in between. Uh, so what I did was again let me explain the ruled surface that i created here i used the edge of that ruled surface as my drive curve or the uh, tilt curve not the drive curve but the tilt curve so i use this for example let me just uh, change this <clears throat> and i'll go to the tool axis control not through the lines but through the curve and I'll pick the tilt curve, which is basically this one. Change the direction. Yes. Yes. Not that entire thing, sorry. We have to change it in a different way. So that's the first direction. second, third, and fourth. So that's the curve that I'm going to use. <clears throat> okay, tilt angle is zero, closest point. Let's hit the calculate button. Okay, perfect. So this is how the toolpath will look like. Let me switch off the ruled surface. You can see that it's going all the way and machining also the fillet, okay? It's just not machining the flank, but also machining the fillet using this mechanism of tilt curve. So if I run the simulation, that's how it's gonna look like. always the tool will find itself to machine in a way uh, it will follow the now you can see that 
I might have some potential collisions. So I can still use the collision method or I can change the uh, link here. Link is too huge. So that's, that's the one that is actually causing the collision. I can go into the link and instead of using uh, automatic arc, I will actually say don't use any kind of leads and lead in and lead out. It's just for our academic purpose. The calculations are all real time, okay? There is nothing that's happening that I've saved something and running in the background. Okay. Can run the simulation again now. Much better. So when it uh, when it uh, follows, what it is doing is it's basically following the edge of the surface. You can always see that the tool axis is passing through the surface. But there is there is another thing that I've applied, and that is the collision check. It's not that it's always going to follow the curve. It might change or it might move away from the curve if it finds collision with these surfaces. So it's tilting the tool also in between. So what I have done here is I have applied a collision check with the drive surfaces and I've said tilt the tool. So if it finds collision, it will tilt, okay? Which means that it might miss following the curve in those areas where it is finding collisions, but it won't lose uh, the uh, direction, okay? The direction will not be lost. It will still do the same thing what it was doing. It will try and follow the curve as closely as possible, but the moment collision uh, thing chick, uh, cl uh, kicks in, it will uh, it will not follow the curve for, for some portion of the area. Otherwise, the toolpath looks really good. Okay, the quality of the toolpath is very nice. Right. Uh, like I said, the floor finishing is simply a copy of the first operation. So the floor finishing looks as if there was no depth applied. So we, I've just copied the first one and said generate one pass and I got the floor done. So the gist of this is that you could take a simple impeller and if you have a generic five axis module in solid cam with you, you can still machine that particular part without going in for any kind of automation, okay? Right, let's look at another part. <clears throat> and this time, I would like to show you another nice part. I know that we are very close to our closing time, but I will definitely take another 15, 20 minutes more. So please uh, have some patience. Whatever parts that I'm not able to show today, I'm going to move them to the second uh, session that we are going to do next week. So another very nice example that we always have come up with is what we now saw was an open impeller. What we have now, what we're seeing now on our screen is a closed impeller, okay? Even this is pretty tricky, okay? Uh, we have to machine these surfaces inside, okay? Now, when you have to machine, of course, you're going to machine one from one side to whatever extent is possible and whatever is not possible, you're going to go from the other side. That's the only way this part can be done. Okay, now how do we control the tool? Okay, you cannot say, I'm going to use tilt angle 90 degrees, always use the flank. It's not possible. Okay, uh, the, uh, the tilt of that, the tilt angle business works only for parts that are simple, do not have any curvatures or do not have any fillets. Such parts cannot be done using that method. This kind of parts can be done only using the curve method or at the most the point method. So what I've done here is I have explained in my tutorial, which you can download uh, from our website, just you have to register and download it. We have got a very nice tutorial made and I've explained why I've taken up that sketch and how that sketch is made. So I have a sketch here. <clears throat> OK, 
okay we have a sketch here it looks very simple if you look it looks very simple two lines but how we have arrived that i have explained it i'm not going to explain that uh, thing here it's explained in the pdf document very clearly how we have arrived that arrived at it i've created a sketch and i'm going to use one of these curves to drive my tool okay so if i go into my uh, one of the methods or one of the toolpaths which is a finishing toolpath i'm using a lollipop cutter here okay the geometry uh, i'm using is the surfaces here these are the surfaces that i've picked up for machining and my upper edge curve because i'm using morph between two curves so i'm going from this curve i'm morphing the pattern all the way down till here okay up to here this area i'm going to morph my pattern in the tool axis control you can see that i've used the tilted through curve mechanism and the tilt curve is this particular curve which i just showed you i've used this particular curve again how i've made this curve why i've made this curve is all explained in the pdf you can download it from our website by registering yourself and the curve tilt type you have used here is from start to end there are many methods the most common one is closest point especially when you're doing aerospace parts structural parts like that but for such parts or tube kind of parts you have to use from start to end okay uh well i'm going to save this and let's calculate this tool path there are other things that I've applied. I'm just going to explain to you uh, what I've done here. Once it finishes the calculation, I'll explain what exactly I've done. On another note, uh, when we are calculating five axis tool paths in, in a generic, you'll realize that you cannot do anything much when the calculation is happening. And that's because uh, it's a 64 bit calculation, calculating engine. So it's using all the cores. So very less amount of cores are left out uh, for other uh, processes to start off so it's better not to run any other processes when it's doing the calculation because it's going to use everything that's available on your uh, computer so it's approximately going to take about one and a half minute to calculate this tool path that's done calculation is done and this is how the tool path looks like so if i do a simple host cat calculation here You can always you can notice one thing. The center point of the tool path will always follow this line. It will start from this point. That's the first cut. So if there are 100 passes, it will plot 100 points on the curve, and each point will correspond to that particular slice. So the tilt will be applied from that particular point onto the slice. How does this look on the machine? So let's look on the uh, machine itself. We have got uh, Integrex here, and uh, I'm going to, uh, not Integrex, I'm sorry, very access from Mazak. Okay, um, let's run the visibility tool path. Okay, fair enough. 
that's the tool part and this is how it's going to look like it will go all the way in to the extent possible avoiding collisions by tilting itself uh, suitably and generating the cuts okay so this tool path what that has been generated is 100 percent collision free against the part okay not the stock but the part there are no collisions with the tool there are no collisions with the holder absolutely checked using the collision check functionality available inside solid cams generic so you can actually machine any kind of a part using this right uh, I'm going to leave out certain uh, paths and uh, I'm going to take uh, go straight away into the last portion of our uh, webinar today or the master class. I'm going to move certain of my uh, paths to our second session. Sorry. Excuse me. Okay, sorry. So, um, I'm going to go into the Auto 3 Plus 2 roughing. Okay, this is uh, something that was asked. I'm going to touch upon that today, and I'm also going to touch upon this on our session two, where we're going to see some more portion of generic five axis. Auto 3 plus 2 uh, was introduced in SolidCam 2021, and this uh, basically does machining of a part in different directions automatically. Of course, there are three methods. One is completely automatic, in which the directions are going to be found by the product, by SolidCam itself. And then we have semi-automatic, in which the user specifies his first preferred direction of approach, and the rest of the directions are found by SolidCam. And the third approach, of course, is manual, where the user defines which all sides he wants to machine the part from, okay? So there are three possible uh, methods. So in automatic, everything, even right, right, the first approach is found by SolidCam. It found, finds out the best possible approach to machine that particular area. And then once it machines the area, it calculates the stock left over and checks with the part to see where all stock has been left beyond what the user has specified, and then creates another direction, machines that by creating an automatic boundary for that area. Once that toolpath is computed, it again recalculates the stock to check where again material is remaining and keeps making directions till the time that no more stock is remaining or beyond what has been specified by the user. Okay, so you, you could have one, two, three, or 10, 20 positions. All these are done automatically by SolidCam. And then you have got the semi automatic method in which I specify or the user specifies his preferred first approach, and the remaining approaches are calculated by SolidCam. And the third one, of course, is the manual, wherein the user defines his preferred. Uh, uh, direction of machining and those can be done. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go back to my turbine blade very quickly, the first one. And we are going to do the roughing. I'll show you two methods in which we do that. So I have got this turbine blade here, okay? And I would like to do the uh, roughing of this. And of course, the stock here not to be defined, we already have it. So I show 3D and I've got the stock out here. So I will define auto three plus two roughing. The tool here I'm going to use is a bullnose, 12 diameter bullnose. And uh, of course, in the three plus two, I'm going to use manual. And I will say, add my first direction. My first direction is going to come from the thinnest 
radius first because in turbine blade machining, the thin radius side is machined first because it has got support. So this is my first direction of machining. So I've picked the plane. My second direction of machining, of course, there are going to be only two directions here unless we think that we are going to need one more. That's my second direction of machining. The depth of cut is one millimeter, side step 50%. And we use the uh, closed offset method. Uh, sorting, let's do zigzag, regions. Everything else looks three axis now. Everything else is basically three axis. So I'm going to use all the three axis parameters. Just move this below that so that I get the full stock and then we hit the calculate button. So what it is going to do is it's actually going to do the first machining, calculate the stock, left out for the second one, find the area, find, create the area, create the toolpath, and here we get the toolpath. So it, I did not define any coordinate systems, nothing. I just said machine this direction and this direction. So let's run the simulation and uh, let's see if it has any potential problems. So I have got the fixture and the Ys, and let's run the simulation here. So we have the first potential problem, and that problem is that it's colliding against the fixture, so it's not gonna work. So I'm going to stop. Doesn't make any sense, because what I didn't do here was, in my geometry, I've got an option to select the fixture. So I'm gonna put the fixture here, and I'll say my clamping fixture to be taken into account, one millimeter offset to be kept against this clamping fixture. And let's hit the calculate button. Sorry, I missed another thing. The other thing was I have not taken into account the holder, so I'm gonna check also for the holder. Let's calculate. Done. Let's run the simulation. Now it would have taken into account everything out here. It will take into account the fixture, the holder, everything, and make sure that there are no collisions. So it's machined from one side. You can see that it's leaving material out here. It's left material even here. And wherever it finds issue, and now it's gone to the second side and it's machining the other side. This was actually a very uh, easy example. Before we end, I'm going to show you a very, very tough example of the most difficult example that you can throw at Auto 3 plus 2, or rather 3 plus 2. Done. So it's automatically done. Now we also have a problem here that we have got material left out here. Okay, if I run the cal uh, the uh, comparison, you can see that a lot of material has been left out here. Now I can simply go back to the edit function, go to three plus two and add another direction. Let's say, uh, let me switch off the toolpath, add this direction here. So there's a third direction also coming up. Let me calculate this again. <clears throat> 
done. Let's run the simulation. So we have one side. The second side. And once this is done, it's going to go to the third side here. Okay, that's done. So we have got, uh, now we have removed the material from every possible direction, okay? So Auto 3 plus 2, you can use it for such parts. Also, like I said, I'm gonna show you a more complex example, and you'll appreciate the fact that in such examples, it is almost very difficult to run three plus two machining because you you will not have any idea from where to start off. The most complex example for auto three plus two can be a Pelton wheel, a Pelton wheel runner. Okay, so I would like to scoop the material here. When you have such a complex part, you first of all will not have no idea from where to start, okay? You can't start it from top. You don't know what angle to give. Maybe well, all you can do is to keep rotating it and figure out a method of finding out the best possible approach for this particular part. Instead of that, in SolidCam 2021, you can just say, generate it automatically. Done. So what do you have if I run the simulation here? If I take it into solid verify. I have the stock mounted on the fixture and then I start simply machining it. So it's found one position better and then it starts tilting itself. All these tilts are calculated automatically by SolidCam. Not only the tilt is calculated automatically, but even the area for machining is calculated automatically by SolidCam. So you can see so much of your guesswork is being thrown, removed completely out by SolidCam's Auto 3 Plus 2. You can think, you have an impeller, you can still do Auto 3 Plus 2. Why do you have to do uh, five axis roughing? You can simply use the, uh, new generation bullnose tools, which are very, very powerful, the high feed cutters. And you can actually go very fast on those impellers and rough out those areas using Auto 3 Plus 2. You don't have to worry, define directions, uh, define collision geometries, nothing. Just give it the part, give the stock, leave it. And it will find everything automatically by itself and it will machine it. Whatever is possible by the tool, by the holder, the length that we have defined, and you can see it's roughed out whatever is possible from that particular tool. What remains, you can put a lengthier tool, just copy the operation, run again, it will run with the updated stock and start calculating again. So Auto 3 plus 2 is a very powerful function. Of course, you need a five axis machine for that. It can't just simply run on machines that can do indexing because there are motions. Uh, in between two uh, planes, it'll connect it in five axis. So you do need simultaneous five axis machines for it, but it completely removes the guesswork. For example, uh, just giving you a simple ballpark figure that if I had to rough out this particular part, 
and I had to do it manually, it perhaps could have taken me anywhere between half a day to one day to find out first the positions. After it has done the machining from one position, simulate it, check, check from which direction I need to do the second one, generate the machining. Oh, it's doing some air cutting. Let's let me try and reduce the area. Once that is done, again find the position. By the time I'm done finishing one area of this, it's already evening. Instead of that, I simply apply this calculation. This took me about 20, 25 minutes, and it did everything by itself. I didn't have to even tell what it has to do. Everything was done, found out. I use the automatic method. You could also say semi-automatic and say my first position is from Z. Find out whatever is possible with Z, and then you can start finding out the other directions. But you can compare something that's going to take you one day against something that's going to take you half an hour. And these results are perfect because there were no collisions. First of all, everything has been taken care of. The directions have been found automatically. And if you look at, if I take this again into a, a machine simulation, you'll see that the angles are also not crazy angles, okay? It's not that the angles are 36.156, that is B angle locked at that angle, and the C is locked at 56.58 or something like that, no. The angles are also pretty much decent, okay? You can see the C is locked here, the first one, and then you can see 135C, 90B, and if I go down below again, 165, 30, and if I go down again, 123.75, 70B. So the angles are also pretty much in the whole number. And that is actually uh, generated by this parameter out here. I have given in three plus two the increment angle. So every time it needs to find a position, it will shift the B and C angle by 10 degrees to locate the area. If it doesn't find, it will tilt 10 degrees more. If it doesn't find 10, 10 degrees more, till the time it finds the proper uh, stock to cut and proper area to enter, it will keep tilting it by the range of, or an increment of 10 degrees each, either on, on B and also on the C, in this case B and C, otherwise it might be A and C or depending on the machine. Right, so uh, we come to the end of our first session. We are going to have our second session on the next, Wednesday, that is 4th of August, same time. And the parts that I could not show today, because that day we are not going to do much of PowerPoint presentation, so I will have approximately half an hour with me, more than what I had today. So I'm going to show you a few more parts, like I'm going to show you a BLISC that is being machined using generic. I'm also going to show you an aerostructural part that was generated using uh, uh, generic and i'm also going to touch upon circle end mills i'm going to show you certain parts with circle end mills for example the blisk the finishing was done with a circle end mill the structural part finishing was uh, done with a circle end mill and of course some more parts and i'm also going to touch upon other areas of my generic machining like multi-axis drilling i'm also going to touch upon uh, uh, the three to five axis conversion, converting a three axis tool path to five axis and uh, geodesic machining. Apart from showing you a couple of parts that I could not show you today, I'm going to show you how we have done the machining. Of course, for people who are interested, these parts are already available on my cloud and I'm going to share the link uh, to all of you. You can download these parts and have a look at how these parts were done for people who would like to see how uh, the closed impeller was done, you can simply log on to our website, solidcam.com, uh, register yourself and download the entire PDF along with the part and machine files so that you can uh, check how it is done. There are several other tutorials out there. Once we finish everything, I'll also give you the access out there, uh, or I'll also show you which all parts are there, whose tutorials are also there. So you have got a tutorial and also the uh, parts along with your machine files. Right, so uh, thank you very much. It was slightly lengthy. We touched close to two hours, uh, but I think it was worth it. Uh, I'm gonna see you again on uh, Wednesday, 4th August, uh, 1 p.m. GMT or 5.30 p.m. India. 
for people uh, who are new to solid cam please go to our website you can download a fully functional 60 day trial version once you have downloaded uh, i forgot once you have downloaded uh, please get in touch with uh, this email id please get in touch with this email id in event that you would like to have training on the product after you have downloaded and installed if you're having problems even installing the product please get in touch with us remember we work uh, uh, 9 30 a.m to 6 p.m india time so your time should match if you're calling from a different country you have to match within that time uh, we work between 9 30 a.m and 6 p.m so uh, you can join one of our trainings or if you're interested we could uh, position a session for you maybe an hour daily for one week and show you how the product works so that you can start working on the evaluation version the product will work for 60 days without any license okay if you have any questions if you have got any issues on installing or downloading the software please note down our email address get in touch with us on this uh, email address and uh, we will uh, we will get back to you with answers somebody asked how to reduce retractions there are several retractions. I'm sorry, I did not understand which retractions you would like to reduce. If you're talking about the Auto 3 Plus 2, it's completely automated. There is nothing much the user can do out there. Okay, those retractions that you're seeing are basically change in positions from one particular BC position to another angle. Okay, those are the angular changes where it needs to retract to a safe position, allow the machine to tilt, and then go back again into the part. So that can cannot be done that's completely automated if you're talking about other retractions in the toolpath of course there are many methods in the links that allow you to reduce the retract you can actually have zero retracts in your entire toolpath right uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar and i'll see you again next week on wednesday 4th august 1 p.m gmt till then take care have a good week have a good day Thank you very much. Bye-bye.